Hey, Alejandro. Good day, how's it going? Good, I like your kitchen, my friend. Thank you. You guys are so busy, you guys have your rally today. We do, we do, I hope you can join. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all online, right? Is there, is it like entertainment? I couldn't tell, like, is it like a rally, but there's like famous people speaking? We have a lot of famous pe people skipping. We're actually pretty excited about it. Did you see the lineup? Um, I didn't get to see the lineup. I've just been seeing like all the visuals for it, which I love. I'll forward it to you. I'll make sure you have it. Yeah, I mean, like, I can tell you, I mean, like I'm a huge fan of Bishop Jakes. Um, and then like, obviously we have Julian Castro. We also have Joaquin Castro. Um, we have uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is the CBC chair. Um, and I know we also have George Lopez and just a lot of wonderful individuals. I'm also really excited about Victoria Niave, who's a Texas State rep, and she's just brilliant. Um, so I'm really, really excited. But let me forward it to you so you can see it. And there's a reason why it's like two hours. Yeah, how did it all kind of come about? You know, it's just working together on the ground um, and wanting to, you know, keep the momentum going, continuing to talk about um, the issue of, you know, racism, the issue of how, to, how you know, current issues are impacting uh, brown and black communities. And so it's, it's for us, it's, you know, like once the protests start, stop, once the marches stop, you know, like we still have to continue to do the work. Um, and so this is part of us continuing to do that work. Awesome. Okay, I'll be right back.
Commissioner Wilson, how are you? I think you might be on mute. Hello, now can you hear me? Okay, yes, I can hear you. How are you? And I can hear you. I am well, thank you. How are you doing? Really good. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I mean, I really appreciate your time and um, it's great to kind of have this ongoing dialogue that we've been having on privacy. And um, when I read your essay, I was just kind of like, she completely, I think so thoughtfully articulated a lot of the concerns a lot of us are thinking through. So I just felt like it would be a really worthwhile conversation to kind of get us all together. Absolutely, my pleasure, my pleasure. Unfortunately, there were no logistical issues in joining. This is one of the most seamless right. presentations I will have done because I just clicked one link and here we are. Yeah, I tried to make it as easy as possible. And so while, while we wait for the other people, this is uh, Cindy Benevi, this is the CEO of LULAC. This is FTC Commissioner Christine Wilson. Oh, Cindy, I think you're on mute. So good to see you again, Commissioner Wilson. Good afternoon, how are you? Doing good, doing good. I, I have um, the fortune to represent Lou Black on the FCC Diversity and Advisory Commission. So I uh, get to work a lot with a lot of different individuals um, around the issue of diversity and inclusion within technology. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's good to see you. I love Thank your you. background. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, where are you? It looks like you're in a cabin. So I am, I am. Uh, we are at our place out in West Virginia. We've been out here basically since the FTC shifted to telework. So uh, I am out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's only 20 cases in the county where we are. So very rural, you know, almost no one here. We're just like Cindy, you've got your head in it. You're like ready for business. It sounds like you're a pro at this. Well, every event that I've done since March 16th has been online. So, um, but, but actually this is a, a, truly one of the least logistically challenging ones that I have done. So kudos to, to you and your IT team. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we also have uh, Leroy who is here with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Leroy, this is uh, Christine um, Wilson, commissioner from the FTC. You wanna say hi, hi? Commissioner Wilson, how are you? I am well, good afternoon. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. It's a pleasure to serve on this panel with you and thank you for your leadership at the FTC. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure, my privilege. Okay. Like we're just waiting on one more person and then we'll kick this. So we have a few minutes left, so um, it should be okay. Alejandro, can you see me okay? <laughs> I, I feel can like see you have you. to work on your whole digital background situation. I know. We have two that we work with. And so this is the, the newest one. And just, you know, I'm having horrific allergies. So my eyes are super watery. Oh. Hey, Brent, how are you? I'm doing fine. Leroy, how are you doing? Doing well, my friend. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Commissioner, great to see you. Thank you for joining the call with us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Excellent. Um, good, good. Yeah, it's been, we haven't seen each other since the, the whole, probably March, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For sure. I left uh, DC March 14th. I haven't been back since, and it doesn't look like my return is imminent. <laughs> I'm finally at that at that conclusion. Where I'm just like, you know, 2020 is a wrap. Like I just, we're at the second half of the year. I don't see anything drastic kind of changing. And with all of the infection rates across the country, I mean, it's not slowing down in the slightest. Yeah, no, it's, it's not. And um, yeah. I mean, we've kind of already made a, a concerted decision to work remotely for the rest of 2020. Oh, really? Wow, okay. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, also, too, our, our building on K Street was severely damaged by the protests in Lafayette Square. So our building right now where our USHCC office is, it's not even open right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, so because we're right, we're just two blocks up from Lafayette Square. So we're, they, our wind, our, all our front facade of the building was vandalized or damaged. Um, so yeah, so, it, so we don't even have a, access to our building right now. That's incredible. Well, Cindy's making us come back to work. So, <laughs> well, Cindy luck for keeps me. us all working. <laughs> <laughs> Never the case, but always doing something. <laughs> no, we were we were actually getting reports um, from our members in Texas where they seem to have a surge, and there's a couple other states that are also facing surges. So, um, you know, we are. I know right now, Brent, we're not looking to even explore that idea until after August. Um, and even then, it's looking like it might not happen. Really? Gee, I was trying to. I was trying to open up. Um, so I was trying to get back to the office sooner, but hey, you know. <laughs> Amy, welcome. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm well. Oh, uh, you've got the best background. <laughs> I was like, that looks amazing. That looks like a great time. It is. I'm out in Castleton, Virginia, just for a couple of days but it's really gorgeous out here. All right, well, it is one o'clock, so let me start this live feed and then we will get started. Is everybody ready to go? Good to go. All right, give me one second and we'll get this started. All right. Hello and welcome to ATTP's Connected Communities Virtual Briefing Series. This digital forum is dedicated to exploring the intersection of ethics, technology, and public policy by engaging scholars, community thought leaders, and policymakers from diverse backgrounds to give greater context to the lived reality of Black and Brown communities in our increasingly digital world. My name is Alejandro Rourke, and I am the Executive Director for Hispanic Technology and Telecommunications Partnership. HTTP is a CEO roundtable of 16 of the country's oldest and largest Latino civil rights organizations who work in coalition to promote access, adoption, and the full utilization of technology and telecommunications resources by the Latino community in the United States. Through our community engagement, a congressional education, and by serving as a national voice for Latinos in tech and telecom policy, HTTP member organizations work to support the social, political, and economic advancement of over 50 million Americans of Latino descent by facilitating access to high quality education, economic opportunity, and effective healthcare through the use of technology tools and resources. Now, before we begin today, I wanna to invite all of our friends who are tuning in live on our website um, to join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag HTTP privacy. That's hashtag HTTP privacy. I'll be checking in on Twitter throughout our dialogue today and have set aside some time towards the end so that our panelists can hopefully have a, a little bit of time to answer some of your questions. So our conversation today really kind of works to center the important role that civil rights principles play in shaping a federal standard to protect consumer privacy as we all continue to experience the fallout of the COVID-19 global health crisis and beyond. The lack of consumer privacy protections in the United States has created a pathway to unintended harms to black and brown communities. For HTTP, privacy is an important civil right that can help curtail discriminatory harms that lead to deceptive voter suppression and misinformation, housing discrimination and digital redlining, employment discrimination, predatory lending, and the facilitation of warrantless government surveillance and policing practices. For privacy legislation to fully protect against the wide arrays of civil rights harms from commercial data practices, we must center the voices of communities most directly impacted by those practices uh, as a way to kind of ensure justice and equality. Uh, it's important that, that we have these conversations and really kind of work to uh, center the, the voices of black and brown communities um, to ensure that they're rep represented throughout this uh, the policy debates. So today we are very honored to be joined by FTC Commissioner Christine Wilson, as well as members of HTTP's CEO Roundtable, including HTTP Board Chair Brent Wilkes from Hispanic Federation, Cindy Benavides, CEO of LULAC, Amy Hinojosa, who is the um, 
the CEO for MANA, a national Latino organization, and Leroy uh, Cavazos Reina, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs um, and International Affairs for the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Now, Commissioner Wilson, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. We very much appreciate um, your leadership on, 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 on the commission, and I specifically kind of um, wanted to include you in this conversation because you recently penned an essay that brought into sharp focus the importance of establishing federal consumer privacy legislation as a means to provide safeguards for privacy and civil liberties as the world, and specifically the, the United States, grapples with the fallout of COVID-19. Could you please share some of your insights and discuss some of the unique vulnerabilities that everyday Americans are being exposed to during this time of uncertainty and rapid deployment and adoption of technology tools? Thank you so much to, uh, to HTTP for, for having me today. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here and I appreciate your interest in this topic. Uh, privacy has been a significant focus of mine since the pandemic uh, began with the increasing focus on the use of health data and location data, not just in the United States, but around the world as a way of potentially containing the spread of the virus, which of course is a good thing, but there are perhaps unintended consequences. And so uh, it is a very important issue to me and I am pleased to, to hear of your interest in the topic and to be here with you today uh, to, to talk about it. Of course, before I begin, I need to give you the standard disclaimer that of course, nothing I say today is necessarily reflective of the view of the Federal Trade Commission or any other commissioner I am speaking uh, on behalf of myself and, and myself only today. So let me begin with a brief introduction. Um, the, the Federal Trade Commission, as you probably know, has a broad consumer protection mission to combat unfair and deceptive practices and privacy falls within this broad mission. So we use our general authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to reach privacy, but we also enforce privacy and data security statutes for certain sectors, including uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which covers credit, COPPA, which covers children's privacy, Gramm-Leach-Bliley and the Safeguards Rule, which cover financial information, and then the Health Breach Notification Rule, which covers some health providers. And for many years, the agency on a bipartisan basis has called for comprehensive federal privacy legislation to boost the jurisdiction and the authority of the FTC in the privacy and data security arena. Tech developments uh, related to COVID-19, including contact tracing and monitoring to ensure compliance with stay at home orders rely on sensitive health and location information. And so these developments have further underscored the need for federal privacy legislation because they've highlighted some gaps in US privacy laws. Federal privacy legislation is necessary, as you said, to protect uh, key consumer protection values that are within the FTC's jurisdiction, but there are also civil liberties that are at issue. You highlighted some of them. Today, I'm gonna to focus most specifically on Fourth Amendment rights. There are claims uh, in public reporting that contact tracing apps have been used by law enforcement to track people for non-public health purposes, and, and we'll get into that in a bit. So today, uh, I, I want to address just a, a handful of topics. First, how the pandemic has underscored the privacy concerns. Second, the constitutional issues that are implicated. Third, the need for federal privacy legislation. And then in conclusion, how to mitigate some of the risks to privacy and civil liberty that we're seeing. So let me start first with the privacy technology and COVID-19 topic. Many governments are turning to technology to help monitor and enforce quarantines and for contact tracing to contain the disease. We've seen this at the federal, state, and local levels in the United States, but we've also seen it in a variety of countries around the world. And many are viewing technology, including comprehensive contact tracing, as key to safely easing quarantines and resuming normal life. But notably, these efforts are fueled by sensitive data regarding people's movements and their health. So one example is the Apple-Google partnership. They recently announced a contact tracing platform that has garnered global attention. Authorities have been invited to create apps for this platform, which relies on Bluetooth technology to detect proximity to other devices. And users receive alerts if they come into contact with infected individuals. 
Apple and Google have promised that users who share a diagnosis via the app will not have their identities disclosed to the companies or other users. The data will only be used by public health officials. Microsoft and the University of Washington have announced a contact tracing app called COVID Safe. Using GPS location data from an infected person's phone, public health authorities can post alerts disclosing the locations visited by the person who has coronavirus. And individuals can use the app to cross-reference the location data in their own phones to determine if they were in the same location at the same time. Uh, these initiatives are new, so little is known about the kinds of information that will be collected, who will have access to it, with whom it will be shared, how long it will be retained, and a host of other questions that we would typically be interested in understanding as privacy experts. There are also really important questions about the efficacy of these apps. And there are recent studies that assert contact tracing via app lacks the superior accuracy of manual tracing. Not only that, there are cautions that these apps may be subject to manipulation for nefarious purposes. And so in the end, it could be the worst of both worlds, right? You're using these technology driven solutions that are first of all, inferior in effectiveness to the manual contact tracing, but second of all, uh, open to being hacked or being exploited for, for nefarious purposes. In, uh, in mid-June, the National Association of Attorneys General wrote a letter to Apple and to Google expressing concerns about unofficial contact tracing apps in the App Store and the Google Play Store, which they asserted may endanger consumers' personal information. So uh, obviously technology holds promise, but it also raises a great deal of concerns. Let me, let me touch briefly on the constitutional issues. The Fourth Amendment protects Americans from government overreach. And in the case law, there is what we call a reasonable expectation of privacy test. And so, if a, if a citizen has a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in something and the government tries to seize it without a warrant, his reasonable expectation of privacy is violated and therefore the Fourth Amendment has been breached. But companies' mass data collection affects our rights under the Fourth Amendment. Consumers, of course, have grown accustomed to surrendering extensive data through their daily use of phones, computers, digital assistants, and other connected devices. And this phenomenon has inevitable spillover effects in the legal arena. In other words, if citizens know and accept that nothing is private, then they have no reasonable expectation of privacy and protections under the Fourth Amendment get eviscerated. So police have long been able to enforce the law based on direct observation of violations. But if authorities identify law violations, for example, contravening stay-at-home orders based on data collection rather than direct observation, the Fourth Amendment may be implicated. In two recent cases, the Supreme Court of the United States limited the warrantless tracking of Americans through cell phone data and GPS devices placed on their cars. While GPS data could help contain the spread of COVID-19, it could also be used to establish violations of stay-at-home orders. Uh, it could also be used to identify people who have attended uh, protests across the country in recent weeks. And there were rumors that, that in fact, that data has been used in that way. And so we at a federal, state, and local level have uh, government entities who are grappling with, uh, with these issues. And, uh, and potentially uh, implicating not just the privacy of, of Americans, but also their civil liberties. Let me, let me talk for a minute about current limitations in federal privacy laws. So, so we do have, as I said, broad privacy authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act, and we also focus on enforcement of specific uh, sectoral privacy laws. Uh, one of those is HIPAA. So HIPAA and other laws govern privacy rules for information that's collected by healthcare professionals and traditional public health contact tracers. But consumers are providing health data to many more entities, including Fitbit, Apple Watch, and the makers of smart thermometers. 
Of course, there's also low tech data collection. As restaurants and other businesses are reopening, they're taking customers' temperatures and they're keeping track of who has visited at what times. There's a, a gentleman named Travis LeBanc, who is a, a Democrat on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, who recently wrote a letter to Acting Secretary Chad Wolf uh, of DHS. And, and he wrote to express concerns about plans to check airline passengers' temperatures before they boarded the flight. He said the pandemic is not a hall pass to disregard the privacy and civil liberties of the traveling public. And I would expand on what Travis said, the pandemic is not a hall pass to disregard the privacy and civil liberties of the public in any way, shape or form, regardless of whether they are traveling or pursuing other activities. So the FTC has, has long used this broad consumer protection authority that I've referenced to safeguard Americans' privacy and data security, but its specific privacy authority is limited. And there is no general privacy law that covers every company that collects data on folks in the United States. So I have called on Congress to pass federal privacy legislation that would provide more transparency to consumers and greater certainty to businesses about the types of data that can be collected and how those data can be used and shared. With established legal boundaries, companies would be better equipped to determine when the government is asking them to cross the line for the public good, if they are being asked to share information with the government or with researchers who in turn would share reports with the government. And also whether those companies should require a subpoena or inform customers before turning over data. Since the pandemic began, there have been a number of bills introduced one by Republicans, one by Democrats, and one on a bipartisan basis that would require companies to get affirmative express consent before collecting COVID-19 data. These bills do agree on some issues, including the need to uh, obtain affirmative express consent rather than infer consent from inaction, the obligation to provide an effective way to revoke consent, and enforcement by the FTC under its authority against unfair or deceptive practices and by state attorneys general. But the proposals diverge on some of the same points that unfortunately previously held up passage of a baseline privacy law, whether the federal law preempts state law, for example, and whether consumers should have a private right of action to, to obtain damages and whether this right can be subject to binding arbitration. Regardless of which bill is adopted, voluntary measures will fail if a critical mass of Americans don't participate. In other words, if there is no digital trust, which should incentivize both the public and private sectors to demonstrate their trustworthiness. And a narrow privacy bill dealing only with the conditions of the pandemic personally, I think, is far less preferable than comparable comprehensive legislation that will provide broad guidance for years to come. So in, in my remaining time, let me just walk through a few steps that can be used to, uh, to mitigate risks to privacy. Uh, I do believe that privacy can coexist with a public health response fueled by big data. Unfortunately, uh, the, the lack of federal privacy legislation in the US has hindered our pandemic response. As I've mentioned, the law would have provided clarity for businesses on the legitimate uses of data during this pandemic, and it would have established guardrails to protect against risks to privacy and civil liberties. But in the absence of comprehensive federal privacy legislation, the FTC has built an impressive record of protecting consumers' privacy and data security. And, uh, and those precedents outline uh, some of the many ways in which risks to privacy can be, can be handled. Uh, and, and one question is why companies and even governments should seek to do this. And the answer is, uh, it is absolutely necessary to build digital trust. It is always important if you want people to take advantage of new technologies that are being developed. But when the efficacy of a voluntary contact tracing app depends on convincing a critical mass of citizens to opt in, the incentives to build trust are greater. So for example, a recent poll found 60% of Americans will not use the contact tracing app 
that Apple and Google have developed because they are very concerned about having their privacy and their, um, the, the outcomes of their coronavirus testing honored. And, and if public health authorities are going to rely on these apps then researchers and companies or governments are, are going to need to bridge that trust gap. So, so let, me, let me run through uh, some ways in which I think this can be done. Um, first of all, in the last few weeks, FTC staff have compiled several excellent guidance documents, both for consumers and for businesses, relevant to consumer privacy and data security in these uncertain times. And I would commend those to you. They are available uh, on the FTC website. Many of them are also available, not just in English, but in Spanish on the FTC's Spanish language web pages. Um, and, and then I want to talk about um, how to mitigate risks with respect to what I have found to be a very useful tool. The Center for Information Policy Leadership called CIPL has developed what they call an accountability wheel in a July 2018 discussion paper that they issued. And the center of that wheel sets out the goal, accountability, effective compliance, and protection for individuals. And, uh, and this wheel lists um, several different ways in which companies can be accountable. First, information, uh, leadership and oversight. So if the CEO views privacy protection as a priority, employees will respond in kind. Second, risk assessments. Companies should assess and document the internal and external risks to privacy. And there are a number of good ways to do this. There are several good models out there, including one uh, from NIST. Third, policies and procedures. Companies should design, implement, and maintain policies and procedures that control for the risks identified in the risk assessment. Fourth, transparency. Companies should be transparent with consumers about the collection and use of data, including new uses of previously provided data. So in other words, uh, if information was collected for one purpose and is now being repurposed, for example, to, um, to track compliance with stay at home orders, that is something that companies should be transparent with consumers about. Fifth, training and awareness. Companies should train employees on their roles and responsibilities with respect to the privacy program. Sixth, monitoring and verification. Companies should monitor and verify compliance through audits and assessments to ensure that employees and third parties with whom they work are complying with access controls, use and sharing protocols and limitations, deletion and destruction mandates, and so on. And then finally, seventh, response and enforcement. Companies must establish procedures to respond to complaints and inquiries and to address non-compliance with, uh, with the privacy protocols of the company. So I believe that best practices like accountability, risk assessment, and risk management will be key to navigating today's challenges with appropriate guardrails, we can ensure that government and its private partners maintain appropriate boundaries while addressing the public health crisis. But the first and most important step is for Congress to pass comprehensive federal privacy legislation. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions. Well, Commissioner, thank you so much for that um, really great overview. I think that there's a lot to, to unpack there. I mean, I actually just want to quickly kind of jump in um, to Cindy, because I know that she has another uh, call that she has to get on. Um, but Cindy, as the CEO of LULAC and one of the country's oldest and largest Latino civil rights organizations, you have a direct connection to impacted communities across the United States and understand Latinos are uniquely vulnerable to discriminatory data practices, specifically when it comes to you know, voting rights and civic participation. So in your opinion, what is the most concern to the Latino community at this moment? And how does our personal data play into that equation? Thank you so much, Alejandro, for, for that question and for inviting me to, to serve on this panel and completely agree with the commissioner in terms of a need of federal legislation that addresses privacy across the country. And, and I will tell you and be honest, Alejandro, that right now what is uh, foremost top of mind for our community is really surviving this pandemic. And you know we already know that 
um, you know, going into this pandemic, um, Latinos and African Americans are disproportionately impacted. In fact, you know, when we look at statistics, and there was a Washington Post poll um, that stated that Latinos uh, are unemployed twice as likely as our Caucasian counterparts. We already know from Surgeon General Adams that Latinos, unfortunately, five out of six Latinos have to leave their houses every single day to work and get paid, which means that we are also in harm's way. And, you know, you add other factors, like we are the essential workers, we are keeping America going, and we're seeing a disproportionate amount of COVID cases occurring across the country, even in, you know, my county or Fairfax County, Virginia, where we're 16.1 of the population, but make up 70% of cases. Um, it's certainly very concerning. And so I can tell you from talking to our LULAC members who represent the Latino community and from connecting directly with the Latino community right now, our community is really um, thinking of how do they survive this pandemic? How are they putting food on the table or making the hard decision of paying for medicine or paying for a utility bill. And I say that because it should be of concern to all of us that as we go into a general election and as we go into um, a really important election this year, um, that so many individuals are focused on simply surviving and maintaining their health and making sure their loved ones are okay, that we are not necessarily paying attention to what may be happening in the tech field. And we already know that technology has made misinformation more efficient and cheap and um, allowed it to be more widespread. And so, you know, as we think of what could be happening in the next coming months, uh, certainly I will tell you, Alejandro, that voter suppression um, is something that is top of mind and it's something that is being facilitated online through targeted ads and intentional misleading posts and LULAC recently joined the stop hate for profit campaign along with ADL and then the boy CP. And we're specifically calling for a boycott on Facebook because we think that they can take action in terms of banning white supremacy groups, in terms of making sure that individuals have correct information. And although they're taking steps um, like having a voting uh, center, um, it's not enough when the community gets the, the bad information first and they are not aware that this voting information exists. Um, I will also tell you that in 2018, uh, in the 2018 midterms, there was over $900 million that were spent in targeted ads. And some of these ads were um, intended, not only intended to persuade voters, but to favor one side or over the other. Um, and as we look at you know, some of the practices that we're seeing in terms of suppressing voter turnout, not only is it you know, the long lines at the voting polls, not only is it the last minute switch of polling locations, but also you see the deception about how or when to vote. Um, and we see different misleading information that says, you know, vote on November 3rd for the president and vote on November 4th for your local representative. And we know that's absolutely wrong. And that unfortunately, you know, people will not know that um, that's mis misleading information um, and um, will potentially show up at the voting booth at the wrong day. And we also know that there's different groups that try to suppress the vote by calling for a boycott to the election. Um, however, we know that we must participate in our democracy and that in order to create that change, in order to make sure our voices are raised, um, that we show up at that voting pool, that we continue to push for vote by mail, understanding that there's a significant amount of support and concern from American citizens who are eligible to vote of COVID-19 at the polls. And so making sure that uh, we participate is very important and knowing that there is um, foreign involvement in trying to suppress voter participation is also very important. And then I will say also there's a significant attempt to threaten and intimidate potential voters and you know how many of us didn't see 
misleading information or post about ICE agents being at the polling stations or, you know, stop voter fraud and wear an ICE hat today or, you know, even putting the wrong election day and the wrong polling numbers. And why that is so important to note, Alejandro, is because um, this is targeted at very specific community. This is targeted at mixed status families. This is targeted at immigrant communities, at refugees communities, at communities of color. Um, but we want to make sure that corporations and companies understand that unfortunately this language can change and it doesn't necessarily have to be ICE is at the voting poll. It can say it can be federal agents or the police is at the, at the vote polling station and that can have the same ripple effect and the community not turning out. And so, you know, as we look at where we go from here, obviously we want to make sure that, um, you know, a couple of steps that can be taken is to ban white supremacists from any platform and also to look at the term of service agreements and ban any uh, activities that incite in, or engage in violence, intimidation and harassment. We also want to see more human content moderation so that um, we're able to enforce those policies, especially companies like Facebook. Um, you know, it's great that they're um, continuing to push their policies forward, but it's also important that there's significant investment and enforcement of those policies. And obviously the evaluation and training is really, really important. And why we say that, Alejandro, and it's so important that internally there really is a civil rights perspective, someone that specifically watch, watches out for this type of behavior. Um, is because we know that hate and that racism changes over time. And although you could say ICE is at the polling location and tomorrow you say the federal agency is at the polling location, it still has the same impact. And you know, for the individual internally to understand those nuances and to be able to train content moderators and individuals internally to be able to detect this is very important. And you know, finally, I, I do think we need to make sure that we don't we ban state actors and bots and trolls that are participating in hateful activities and the truth is alejandro you know we're getting ready um august 3rd to to come upon the anniversary of the el paso shooting and we know that words matter we know that unfortunately deception um can lead to voter suppression we know that misleading information can keep people at home um can create fear and incite division in so many of our communities and that's why it's so important that companies are paying attention, that they really put at the forefront um, the values of their consumers. And I think we're at a time and place in America where it's not only about the shareholders, but it's also about the stakeholders. And that's us, it's the consumers. And so making sure that there's a balance and that the stakeholders are put front and center um, is very, very important and ensuring that our democracy um, is safeguarded. Um, and with that, Alejandro, thank you so much for having me and thank you to all the panelists. Um, and I am so sad that I'm going to miss your presentations, but we'll be hopping off. Gracias. Thank you, Cindy. I, I think what, what we're really kind of hearing um, through the, the, the commissioner's remarks and Cindy's remarks is that, you know, um, our personal data really has um, led to a lot of impressive and transformative innovation. But it's also, I think, has resulted in a lot of kind of unintended harms, right? Specifically when it comes uh, to kind of vulnerable communities. So, I mean, I, I really kind of want to get to this idea of, um, you know, the data that kind of like under the surface is what facilitates a lot of the specific kind of harms that, that, that Cindy are articulated. Um, but Amy, I, I wanted to kind of like bring you into the conversation because similarly, you know, as CEO of MANA, you know, a national organization that represents the interest of Latina women, youth and families, um, and communities across the United States, you've been advocating for the establishment of a federal consumer privacy standard for a while now. I'd love to bring in your perspective into the conversation to see if you would share kind of like why this is an important uh, priority issue for Latinas and why you think a federal standard is the best policy solution. Thanks so much, Alejandro. And I really want to echo so many of the things that Commissioner Wilson and Cindy were talking about because, you know, we've seen that as people begin to understand more and more what's happening when they use apps on their phone and when they 
um, agree to user agreements that they're not reading and the terms uh, of those services. Um, I, we're starting to see states now pick up this work and try to create legislation in their own states for how to control what's happening with folks data. And it really underscores the need for federal legislation because we need rules of the road. We can't just have um, one set of rules in one state and you cross the state line and you've got another set of rules and your phone might have a phone number from a state that you don't live in. You know, and, and so there are just so many overlaps that we need to make sure that we're not just creating a patchwork, but that we're creating an actual rules of the road that apply to everyone, um, not just um, content developers not just app developers but um you know large corporations as well and so to get to because uh, unless everyone understands the rules of the road and there are rules of the road to follow then we're never going to be able to get to the point where we're protecting consumers the way we need to protect them and at the end of the day that's what it's about making sure that whatever information that you put whether it's just for something as simple as you know or, or data that's collected whether it's watching a youtube video or doing a google search or you know, even more important things like the contact tracing information that you're not just blanket allowing anyone to see it and use it as they please. Because one thing is um, the nefarious intent of using the data, but the other is the aggregation and the sale of it. Because I think consumers don't understand it's not just the company that takes your, your data or, or is collecting your data from your app or whatever you're using on your phone, but then it's what happens after that. What are they collecting that data for? Where are they selling it? Who are they selling it to? And what's it being used for um, moving forward? And so part of what we try to do at MANA is educate consumers and make sure that they understand that anything from giving your DNA swab for Ancestry.com to um, you know, the apps that you use on your phone and different things that you're doing throughout the day, you need to understand what's happening with your data and how that's being used out in the open market. And so, um, so much of it is consumer focused in terms of having folks understand. And you know, the terms of service, unless you're an attorney and I'm not, unless you're an attorney reading through that legalese on those terms of service, you just don't understand what's happening there. And so there has to be a simplification based on, you know, federal legislation that says, okay, can I opt in? Do I want my um, data to be sold? Do I want it to be used, um, you know, with other collective data? We have to give consumers the power over their personal information because other folks are monetizing it. And, uh, you know, and it, what you can call it unfair, you can call it um, unethical. It, folks just don't understand what's happening with that information. We, you know, and I think that everyone does this where if you don't hit okay, or I agree, you can't use that app or you can't update your phone. And so it it's almost not a choice for consumers at this point. And we have to get it back to the point where it is a choice for what consumers are doing with their information. Yeah. Uh, no, Amy, I completely agree. I, I think that, that right now, um, all of us kind of understand uh, when I kind of go onto, let's say Facebook and I post a picture, I expect my friends and family, people that I, that I have connected with to be able to have access to that information. I don't however expect or understand or you know, consent to that information being kind of repackaged and resold without my consent to some third party that I have no relationship with. And I actually wanna, um, Commissioner Wilson, you I think said it best um, in your essay and where, where you say that there is there is um, a trove of information that was collected under the guise of cataloging our coffee preferences and transportation habits. Um, and right now it can easily and simply be reprocessed in an instant to restrict our movements of freedom, um, to impinge on our freedom of association and silence our freedom of speech. And I just think that that really is the reality in which we all live in. And I think that um, we're having this conversation today because there is no set kind of like legal recourse that us as consumers have um, to, to, to really kind of um, center um, our kind of like individual rights to kind of like our, our, our data. And I think um, one thing that I think is, is that I want to kind of like bring into this conversation is um, I want to bring Leroy in because at this point we know that there's, there's actually broad consensus, consensus within the, the business community about the need for consistent 
and clearly defined rules of the road when it comes to protecting consumer privacy. But oftentimes this is seen as an issue um, for large internet companies like Google or Facebook. But um, Leroy, as the Vice President of Government and International Affairs for the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, why is this also uniquely a small business imperative for Latino owned businesses? Well, Alejandro, thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner, for your insights. You know, the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce represents the interests of 4.7 million Hispanic owned business enterprises across this country who combined contribute an estimated $800 billion to the US economy every year. And that comes with a grave responsibility. And when we're talking about consumer data and consumer privacy, it's very important to underscore that some of our most vulnerable businesses across this country, not only Hispanic businesses, there's over 30 million his small businesses in America and we must protect their ability to operate in a way where when it comes to consumer data and privacy that we're not affecting their bottom line or that people don't feel comfortable or confident with shopping with them. And furthermore, we have an economic responsibility and Congress has an economic responsibility to protect those businesses who are currently fueling the recovery of, of, of our economy. Um, and so I think that now more than ever, now that we've moved into this virtual space, now that we've seen what has happened um, as people have accessed government programs to recover their businesses, how people are utilizing technology to take their businesses from an in-person experience to a virtual experience. Now more than ever, we have a social responsibility to protect these businesses widespread across America, not by a state by state, fragmented piecemeal solution. We must be intentional in, in, this, in this effort and to say that if we are going to expect people to continue to conduct our day-to-day -day business in a virtual manner, to mitigate health risks of coronavirus across this country, then we need to act responsibly in how that virtual setting is operated. And we must not make it um, more stringent for small businesses and minority businesses to operate in this new norm. If anything, we should make it easier for them. We should make it easier for them to serve their customers, easier for them to grow economically, to stimulate their local economies, and easier for them to make their consumers feel confident in the services and in their ability to keep their data and their information private. We must not allow this privacy conversation to further cast Latino businesses and minority businesses in general in this country into the shadows under a wave of because in consumer information is being shared, people don't feel confident with conducting their business online or with making purchases online or with looking at online advertising because we don't know who's watching or where this is going. So we need, to, we need to declare that misinformation does not have a place in the new norm of virtual consumer experiences in this country. And, and it's time, it's time for us as organizations to, to have a call to action with Congress to sit at the table of this legislation and, and, and do what's best for everybody in this pandemic. Um, we have to find opportunity in crisis. And I think that this piece of legislation, uh, Commissioner and Alejandro, it, it's fitting for the times. And it's something that we can get done in a bipartisan manner on both sides of the aisle, because it will only benefit the continued economic vitality that's so necessary in America right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well said, Leroy. I, I think fundamentally the way that I really approach it in my role as, as HTDP is that we want to see that next like multi-billion dollar company, you know, by a Latino founder that started that has their own origin story in their garage, right? And I think that right now what's happening is as the states kind of like 
pass their own kind of like statewide uh, policies to protect consumer privacy, I think well-intentioned, right? Stepping up where, where Congress has failed to do so. What, what, what's happening is that these big companies are able to comply with that patchwork of, of standards, but it makes it even more difficult for small businesses who are the backbone of, of, of this country to compete. To say like, if I have an app or if I'm doing e-commerce or if I'm engaging in some kind of way with consumer data, I am now responsible for complying to 50 plus different um, regulatory regimes across the country. So I think that that is something that I think is worth um, underscoring and just and just really kind of um, being cognizant of that, that without a federal standard, it really does have you know, a chilling effect when it comes to kind of uh, empowering small businesses to compete um, in, 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 our, in our economy. Alejandro, so, and if I may share real quick, you know, I, I come from the corporate sector. I work for one of the top three brands in the world. And, and you're absolutely right that it is so hard. And the USHCC represents the majority of Fortune 500s in this country. It is imperative that we allow these large companies to operate in an environment where they too can create jobs and where they too can serve their consumers in a way that is beneficial to stimulate the economy. And state by state solutions is not the answer. The answer is a, a widespread federal legislative approach because it is very hard coming from the, that corporate private sector I can tell you it it's hard to comply with with ordinances and local laws that that have been passed in in five or ten or twenty or fifty states and territories across this country so in this space in particular it is so critical that we have an approach that our big corporations in america can also adjust to and can comply with so that they can continue to access their customers in a way that's safe for them and that complies with this proposed federal legislation. It's so critical. I saw it firsthand when I worked in the private sector and I'm sure that our corporate members would really appreciate a widespread solution and not something that they have to comply with 50 different ways across America. Yeah, thank you Leroy. So Brent, I, I wanna kind of like bring you into the conversation because you've been a long time advocate in tech and telecommunications policy, specifically working to center the end user experience of, of Latino communities. And at the root of this entire conversation, there are two important questions. You know, number one, who owns our personal data and how can that data be used or shared with or without our implied consent, right? So do you mind sharing some of your thinking on these important questions and also why do you think that civil rights principles are a critical component to helping to curb consumer harm? Well, thank you, Alejandro, and thank you to Commissioner Wilson for joining us today. It's been a fascinating discussion so far and really important to all of us, especially during this time frame of COVID-19 when so many of us rely on technology tools to be able to communicate. And of course, more and more people are going online and using this information. So to answer your question in as simple as terms as possible, we believe that it is, it is the consumers that own the data that they create. Um, that should be the first line in any federal privacy legislation, uh, a right that consumers own their data and that no one else has a right to have access to it without their permission. And this is really important because I think so many of these companies um, are under the impression that for some reason they own the data, even though the consumers are the folks that produce the data that they're monetizing. And they were getting so used to it, I think as Cindy mentioned, that it's been priced into their stock. So now uh, the valuations of these companies assume that they have the right to access the data from consumers without anyone um, questioning that, without anyone controlling that, or without anyone um, um, you know, kind of indicating what types of data they're allowed to have access to and um, how they uh, are permitted to use it. So that's pretty pretty important, I think, to establish this fundamental principle. But secondly, it's important, you know, okay, so what if consumers do own the data, as it was pointed out earlier as well, so many of them don't read those very complicated uh, terms of service. I think Amy was mentioning this. And so there's really an unfair negotiating position that we're all in. Um, you know, we don't really have um, the option to hire a team of attorneys 
to be able to sit down and negotiate terms of service with these companies and, and make sure that there's a fair exchange, not unfair exchange, but basically you want access to my data. Um, I probably deserve to have a little bit more than a flashlight um, app that turns my flashlight on my phone on and off uh, in exchange for that. So um, let's have a real discussion about what you're giving to us and then what we're getting in return. And we should put on the table that monetary compensation um, is certainly something that should be permitted. Um, for example, in the music industry, if an artist creates a song and a radio station wants to play it, they're permitted to do that, uh, especially if they're online, but they do have to pay a royalty every time they do that. And so there's compensation for the data that's, or, or in this case, the, the music that's produced by that artist. So shouldn't there be something similar going on with consumers when we produce something of value and the folks, companies wanna have access to it, they have to negotiate um, with a representative of consumers to be able to um, have that right to access that data, not just you know have a really complicated terms of service and you know basically you take it or leave it. You either press yes or you press no, and if you press no, the app doesn't work. Um, speaking of which, the federal privacy legislation should say, look, if you want to be in the practice of harvesting people's data, and consumers are given a choice to press yes or no, you should be required if they press no to still make the app work. So you shouldn't be able to turn off the app if they refuse to give you the data. Why? Because you know, you're know you already probably going to get so many yeses anyway, you'll maybe be able to make money. But if you're really serious about protecting people's uh, privacy, they should be able to say, no, I don't want you to have access to my information, but I still want to be able to use the service that you're offering. So these are really important principles. And the reason why we think it is really tied into um, civil rights legislation, uh, there's, there's a number of angles here. Certainly, Cindy talked a lot about how a lot of this data is being misused uh, because they've got so much information that they've compiled on us. Basically, every American has a dossier of data that's been collected about them that helps companies target information to them. That ability to do that can be misused by, um, frankly, stok stoking hate uh, by pitching to people and pressing their buttons and getting them to, um, uh, instead of unifying the country, actually splitting the country apart. And we've seen how that translates not just into bad feelings, but actually harm done. And as Cindy mentioned, the El Paso situation where 22 people were killed um, because someone online's buttons were pushed by hateful rhetoric. So we need to, we need to make sure that um, that's not allowed for one thing, uh, but also um, that there's you know, prohibitions about how the data that, that's been collected on us are used and certainly targeting us for discrimination, for hate, for uh, other types of civil rights violations are prohibited in this federal privacy legislation. I think the other aspect though, and this sometimes gets escaped is the fairness of all of this. So I personally pay about hundred dollars a month for my broadband access at home. I pay about $300 a month for my wireless bill. I paid a thousand dollars for my cell phone. I paid a $1,500 for my laptop. I'm shelling out a lot of money and then what's the purpose of all this so that someone, other company can for free without paying me and compensating me at all, can use all that information and uh, that's compiled by, by these apps and by these websites um, to make money themselves. And some of these companies are very wealthy. They're, they're, they're valued at very uh, high dollar, dollar amounts of money. And it's all because basically the consumers are putting up the cost um, to make their profit margin for them. And there should be a discussion about, is, is that really a fair way of doing this? Um, especially since, um, I was just on a panel yesterday talking about universal broadband and the need to make sure that everyone has access to broadband. It doesn't really seem fair that consumers have to be um, footing the entire bill to do that um, just so that these other companies can make a ton of money off of it without actually helping them out um, at all uh, uh, in terms of affording that bill. So another civil rights discussion has to be, okay, how do we make sure that there's a fairness in this process where um, we can help consumers get access, especially low-income consumers, get access to the internet um, be, and, and have that basically part of the tab picked up by the companies that are monetizing the data that those very same consumers are going to contribute um, that they're going to be accessing. So that should all be part of this comprehensive bill that um, uh, Commissioner Wilson was talking about that would help us um, you know, ensure that there's fairness in the process. Otherwise, we're going to have a situation where you know, consumers continue to get squeezed and continue to have their um, rights to their own data violated. And what they get in return is really not anywhere close to 
what the true value there. And then, of course, the abuses that come in place uh, where we are targeted uh, in violations of civil rights, or certainly I'm, I'm sure uh, Commissioner Wilson's also quite well aware of, of how oftentimes we are duped or scammed or otherwise um, you know, tricked into um, other financial loss that can, uh, through, through folks who are misusing the data that they've been able to acquire about us online. So um, all those things are things that we worry about when we look at this from the Latino consumer perspective. And we certainly wanna see that addressed in the federal privacy legislation. But I do agree with all the panelists. I think that it's important that we have a federal legislation to handle this, but we do have to make sure that that legislation is strong, that it's pro-consumer, and that we do put uh, a balance so that consumers aren't negotiating with huge companies and we're doing it all by ourselves and we're, that negotiation is basically taking place at the time we press a button to say whether we want an app to work on the phone we just paid a thousand dollars for or not and i think that um you know that's that's not fair that's not a real negotiation somebody has to be representing the interests of consumers in this whole debate and frankly that comes down to congress and the ftc so um, we hope to see some strong legislation here. and We hope to see um, um, some champions for Latino consumers out there rising to the challenge. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brent. Um, that was, you know, that's, that's why you're our board chair. You always have a very thoughtful approach to kind of thinking through these issues. So I think from, from my perspective, it really is clear that today's unregulatory data practices have severe implications for, and potential for employment discrimination housing discrimination as we've discussed, increased government surveillance, socioeconomic inequities, and personal safety. And I think that for any congressional action to be effective at protecting consumers, it must address civil rights to ensure that there's a clear language, so to just ensure there's a, you know, explicit kind of like, we said it, there's clear language that addresses anti-discrimination and equal opportunity, use limitations and consent frameworks, individuals' rights, um, and also creates explicit limitations for how the government entities can collect and share personal information. And so I've been kind of scrolling through um, our Twitter feed and Commissioner Wilson, I know that um, you share a lot of similar concerns and we have a, a couple of questions that I think would be great to kind of um, have you kind of like end our conversation with. And because I think that some of these questions, the, the main question that, that there remains is, what is it going to take for us to see congressional action on consumer privacy? Like, in your opinion, what's the best, the best kind of pathway forward? And, you know, what, what role do you think that partisanship plays into the public debate? I kind of just conjoined a lot of different questions that we got online, um, but I think that um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. So I think uh, it, it is... It it is a good question. What will it take for us to see congressional action? We have had um, a, a very long line of Federal Trade Commission commissioners calling on Congress to pass comprehensive federal privacy legislation on a bipartisan basis. And it seemed as if we were coming very close to actually seeing congressional action toward the end of last year, a number of different bills and draft discussion bills were introduced. Unfortunately, um, we, they did not get across the finish line. And uh, I wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed for, um, on this issue saying, okay, now we've got, first of all, uh, the, the health and location information that is being collected on a very wide scale for, uh, for purposes of containing the pandemic. And then second, uh, we see rumors of uses of location information to identify people who have taken part in the protests uh, for, for the last several weeks. And, and we know that widespread collection of information without any limitations on the uses to which that information can be put spills over into um, impingements on civil liberties. And so if Congress isn't going to act now, when, right? I mean, the, the stakes are very high. We're not just talking about privacy, we're talking about civil liberties. And so I, I would love to see Congress act. And I have heard that Congress will act when they hear from stakeholders that this is the number one issue. Now, granted, you know, Congress has just a, a number of 
crises that they are currently dealing with. Um, American lives are literally depending on congressional action, including um, you know, all of the uh, different provisions in the CARES Act that went to sustaining the economy and propping up small businesses and, uh, and, um, and making sure that, that we have the resources we need to combat the pandemic. And so granted, they have a full plate but this is an incredibly important issue. And I would love to see all stakeholders say, this is, this is an incredibly important priority. And if we can all say it's the number one priority for Congress, then, then I've heard Congress will act. Um, I, I think it's very interesting in terms of bipartisanship, you asked about bipartisanship. Um, it's very interesting that a number of panelists today mentioned the need for one comprehensive federal privacy bill instead of a patchwork of different state laws. It is a point that I have made. Obviously, the internet doesn't stop at state boundaries, let alone national boundaries. And so for the purposes of providing clear rules of the road, as a number of panelists have said today, but also uh, you know, just to provide the, the predictability and certainty for businesses in terms of what information they can collect and to what uses it can be put and with whom it can be shared under what um, parameters, but also to provide transparency to consumers across the United States, no matter what phone number your phone has, no matter which state you are in, um, you need transparency about the kinds of information that are going to be collected and how it's going to be shared and used and monetized because, as a number of uh, panelists have mentioned today, none of us has time to read all of the different privacy notices. And so preemption is key, but that's been a sticking point on the Hill. And another sticking point has been private rights of action. And so I would call on Congress to say, we understand preemption and private rights of action have been two significant sticking points. Um, it is a hard job to hammer out federal privacy legislation, but the American people have elected you, we have put our trust in you, and we are asking you to roll up your sleeves and sit down and do the hard work of figuring out the compromises and getting this legislation across the finish line, not only for privacy, but for health and for civil liberties reasons, it is imperative to do this now. Yeah. Um, well, very well said, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us again today and for this great conversation and again for your work on the commission um, and to HETP's member organizations for their insight today. Please make sure to follow the work of our panelists at Hispanic Federation, LULAC, MANA, the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'll make sure to put their information as well as um, Commissioner Wilson's Twitter handle in the video description below. Um, and please also make sure to follow HTTP on our social channels at HTTP policy to be the first to hear about our upcoming conversations presented as a part of our Connected Communities digital briefing series. And until then, please make sure to, to tune into the conversation, speak out and stay connected. Um, the future needs all of us. So thank you guys again for a great conversation and have a great day. Thank, thank you so you much for having me. Take care.